are of interest and uh, concern to everyone here at the college. First off, I'd like to start off by telling you that I think Utah Technical College has an enviable reputation, and we're very proud of that. Now and again, I receive a letter, and I'd like to share a part of one with you. I thought it appropriate to write you a short note stating that approximately a month ago, my daughter visited your institution to see if she'd like to go to school there. She was very much impressed with several things about your institution. First of all, the friendly reception which she received in the admissions office. The courtesy with which she was dispatched to the drafting department. The first class treatment which she received from the head of the drafting department and the little tour which he gave her. She was extremely impressed with the instructors and students which she encountered during her visit. I believe she has written for application papers and I'm sure barring some unforeseen accidents she'll be one of your students this coming year. It is so seldom that people in our position get some good news or a positive reaction to some of the things we try to do that I thought I would try to help make your day by telling you that a rank outsider was greatly impressed with your total operation. <clears throat> now that letter comes from the vice president of uh, Casper College in Casper, Wyoming. The college, as you have seen this morning with our enrollment figures, has had phenomenal growth, as is evidenced by the large number of personnel who are here this morning. In 1969-70, the total enrollment at this institution, day and evening, was less than 3,000 students. This fall, we'll exceed 6,000 students, in addition to the 300-plus in, in our college center. Every now and again, I, I run on to a, an interesting comment to confirm this idea that I have advanced, that we have an enviable reputation. Just a few days ago, as Mr. Johnson said, he is interviewing an application or an applicant for the security position here at the college. And uh, I happened over to his office and I met the young man. He had been a student here in our business department before, and he graduated here, receiving his certificate our degree, and then he went to another institution, and he uh, told me, I didn't recognize that he had been a student here, but he told me that he had been a student at another institution, and he said, I, I'd just like you to know that I was in the business department here at Utah Tech, and it's a great department. He said, it's a much better department than the one at the school which I just concluded my training at. I thought that was uh, very significant. A few days ago, Commissioner G. Homer Durham made a speech up at Snowbird, and he made a couple of statements that I'd like to <clears throat> refer to this morning. First, he said that probably there will be no new school established in the state of Utah during the next 10 years. Well, I salute uh, Commissioner Durham for that comment because our tax base will hardly support the nine public institutions that we now have in the state of Utah. He also said that there will be little growth in the enrollment picture at the nine institutions. Now that may be well for the system as a whole, but I can assure you that that isn't so for Utah Technical College. As our figures illustrate, we will continue to grow and uh, certainly in the next decade, instead of 6,000 students, it probably will be closer to 7,500 or even more. Now. This imposes a tremendous responsibility and a challenge on each and every one of us because it's hard to grow. It's difficult to realign your facilities and your organization to meet the challenges ahead. So it does impose a tremendous responsibility on each of us. And certainly we desire to retain this tremendous reputation which we have. I seldom go to a Kiwanis meeting on Thursday that someone doesn't say, Nelson, You've got a great college out there. I was in the Chamber of Commerce Military Affairs Committee just this week, and a gentleman who operates a paper house here in the, uh, the, the valley said to me as I walked in the meeting, he said, here comes the man who runs my favorite college. And of course, he's a well-known graduate of the University of Utah. So we do have an enviable reputation, and we can all be proud of it. Now. Let me comment for just a few moments <clears throat> on Utah's growth and development. All of you know that Utah is growing faster than the national average. 
We have had fantastic growth predicted here in the fossil fuel, fuel areas. In the next decade, we will have fantastic growth in those areas, and principally that's coal and oil shale. And I think it's inevitable that considerable growth will come about in the, in the state of Utah, and with that growth, of course, adds, again, additional responsibilities on this college. Now, training in the established areas here at Utah Technical College won't be a problem. We can train more students in welding, in drafting, in machine shop, in printing, and areas which are already established. But the problem, and my concern, and I'm sure your concern, is training in areas that are not presently in the curriculum. Now, we've been hearing, we've been talking about, we've been reading about all of this fantastic growth that's going to come about here in the next decade. Well, now, that's just great. But no one has ever defined up to this time the training requirements. Now, again, I'm not worried about meeting the training requirements in those areas in which we have established. If necessary, this college can operate on a 24-hour basis, and it may have to before the next 10 years is over. But the thing I'm concerned about is somebody getting specific, because we can't establish programs overnight. It takes lead time, and that is our concern. Now, I get a bit shaky when I go to a public meeting, as I recently did at the Hotel Utah, and here's the governor of our state up there talking about the growth and development and the need for people down in the Kaparowitz Project and the need for people out in the Uinta Basin. And then he points me out and singles me out, and he says, Jay, your institution has a great responsibility here to prepare these trainees. Well, I agree with him fully. We have a great responsibility. But somebody better be specific and tell us what that responsibility is, because we can't dream about what we should be training. If we do, we're going to get ourselves into a trap that I've heard many times, you know, when <coughs> students can't get jobs, then the schools kind of defend themselves and they say to the Department of Employment Security, we trained them, now you place them. And the Department of Employment Security says, you didn't train them right, so we can't place them. Now, that certainly is not a situation that we want to be in. And hopefully, industry is going to level with this college and other institutions in the state of Utah. Hopefully. A short time ago, I heard the uh, mayor of Rock Springs, Wyoming, talk at the Economic Development Conference at the University of Utah. And he had this to say. Industry didn't level with us. Those of you who are familiar with Rock Springs and Green River know that the population has mushroomed, that the people are living in trailer houses all over the mountains and every place else. And the mayor says, we're in such a mess because industry didn't level with us. Now, what he went on to say was that industry, for example, would tell us that they were going to have 200 employees by January of next year. And he said, we proceed to to get the facilities for those 200 employees. But about the time we get started preparing those facilities, we find that industry doesn't have 200 employees, they have twice that much. So they are in a terrible situation over there. And Utah certainly could find itself in many areas of the state in a similar situation. As you know, some cities have already declared a moratorium on building. Price is an example there, because they don't have the water, they don't have the electricity, they don't have the housing, they don't have the sanitary facilities. And this may happen as certain areas of Utah begin to develop. Now I'd like to <clears throat> talk about another subject for a moment or two, which uh, we will term articulation of instruction. After 28 years, <clears throat> this subject gets a bit tiresome to me, and I want to really uh, speak out and tell you how I feel about articulation of instruction. I think it's a great idea. It's just too bad it isn't working. Now, what I'm talking about is the cooperation between high schools and post-high schools in the types of training programs that we're operating. <clears throat> the State Department of Education in the past seven or eight years, and many of you faculty members have been involved in the process of developing curriculum guides. Those curriculum guides today, in most instances, are gathering dust on the shelves of the high school teachers and on the shelves here at Utah Technical College. 
The other day I called over to one of the departments here in our college who was uh, assisting in the preparation of one of these guides and asked if I could have a copy. We haven't been able to find one. Well, now I'm not indicting those of us here at the college, nor am I indicting the high school teachers around the state of Utah. But if articulation of curriculum is ever going to mean anything, then the high schools are going to start here, and they're going to teach this unit, and they're going to move on to this unit and this unit. And then when the students arrive at Utah Technical College, we will know that they've had this and this and this, and we can start here. But it isn't working, and that's quite deplorable. Take a student who comes to the college in automobile, automobile mechanics. We can't start him up here because we don't know that he's had this down here. And our teachers are very much on the ball, I believe, in attempting to find out what the individual has had. In some instances, we test students in the various departments of the college to see if they are able to move up to here, and we find that they aren't. Now, there are high schools in the valley who the high school teachers are doing tremendous jobs. We know that when we get a student, for example, from some high schools, that the automotive training has been great, or the electronics training has been great, or the drafting training is great, and they can perhaps even skip a quarter of our program. Now, that's what we mean by articulation. But it isn't going to work unless somebody gets on the ball and starts policing it. And I suppose the only way we police things is don't give them the money if they don't do what they're supposed to do. Now, it is essential that we coordinate our training programs. I think the State Department of Education has a tremendous responsibility to make sure that the articulation program works. And if they're not going to police it, it isn't going to work. Now, they are taking a step in the right direction this year, I believe. They are starting an uh, uh, evaluation process of the high school programs throughout the state of Utah. And uh, I think as they look at those high school programs throughout the state of Utah, they're going to find the very thing that I'm complaining about this morning, that those teachers in the high schools, for the most part, are not starting where they should be starting so that we can take up here and go on. It's a very serious problem, and I s sincerely hope that we will be able to do something about it. If the, again, again, I say, if the State Department of Education isn't going to police the articulation program, then doggone it. The high schools better revert to giving an overview of the occupation in which they're attempting to teach, making students aware of it, but not attempt to train them for job competency. And unless the State Department polices it, that will never happen. Now, I'd like to talk to you about one other thing. There's much more I might say about this, but in the interest of time, I hope you've got the picture. The next item I'd like to confer with you briefly, and I hope everybody is aware of this, because I believe we can save souls in this next program. I'm talking about the college advising program. A couple of years ago, Mr. Tilt, then Dean of Students, was instrumental in helping establish a student advising program here at the college. And I'm happy to say that in some areas of the college it's working very well. In other areas, we need to get on the ball and attack the problem. Now, the advising program simply is this. It's explained in memorandums, of course, but each instructor in this college is given the names of approximately 20 students each quarter. And that instructor has then the responsibility to confer with that student, make sure he understands his mission here at the college, what he needs to do to accomplish his objectives, and so on and so forth. Now the problem, some of the problems that I see is that in some areas of the college, the faculty member has an advising hour or an hour in his office but we are expecting the students to come in and talk about their problems, and this just isn't happening. What we need to do here at the college is every instructor needs to assume the responsibility for the students he has to advise, to make appointments with those individuals, to bring them into the college and talk to them at least once each quarter. Now, I can give you a number of illustrations how caring really helps. Just yesterday, I heard of a, 
of a situation which uh, I'd like to uh, mention a name and tell you that one of the instructors, his name is Carson Magnuson, uh, did a very fine thing this summer. Carson was teaching a sociology program. He found in the large class that he had that there were 12 students who weren't coming, who dropped out. He wrote a letter to, to all 12 of them, inviting them to come back and offered his assistance in helping them meet the requirements for this particular class. And as uh, Mr. Matthews uh, informed me yesterday, nine out of the 12 came back, accepted his invitation, were successful in completing the class. Now that may be going the extra mile, but that's certainly a good example of advising. Now another situation that is not quite that pleasant uh, from my point of view happened here at summer graduation. Just a couple of weeks ago, there were five students who in this particular auditorium appeared to graduate and there were no certificates of graduation available for them because they hadn't completed the requirements for graduation. Well now, I think it's atrocious, frankly, that a student would attend this institution for three quarters or six quarters and then not know that he hasn't completed the requirements of graduation. Now from my point of view, the college advisory program could save that student now, I don't know how many of you know this. You hear all the time about the University of Utah losing 40 or 50 percent of their freshmen the first year. Well, do you know that here at Utah Technical College we lose one-third of the student body every year? I think that's atrocious too. And I think the college advising program will help save those students. And therefore, I think every individual here needs to know about that college advising program and recommend to students that they see their advisor and make sure that they get some help they need. Now our responsibility here at the college is to save people. If the individuals who start our programs aren't qualified to, to take electronics, then let's just not boost them out of school. Let's help them into another program here at the college. I think the advising program can do that. And I challenge you as faculty members and as personnel here at the college to make that program work. I could give you other illustrations of what's creating the dropouts. I hope that your division chairman will talk about this subject to you in your division meetings. Now I'd like to just advise you of <coughs> two other items briefly. And the first one, the next one, is individualized instruction. We have a great individualized instruction program here at the college in our pre-tech division. I hear lots of fine compliments about it. The teachers there, I'm sure, are dedicated in doing a very fine job. Individualized instruction. The State Board for Vocational Education passed a regulation in 1971 recommending that all vocational education in the state of Utah be individualized and that, that it be open entry, open exit. We have made some progress toward the achievement of that State Board policy. This past May, the State Board of Regents, in preparing a state plan for vocational education, came forth with a recommendation that all post high schools in the state of Utah who are providing vocational training do it on an individualized, open entry, open exit basis. In view of those recommendations, the college has prepared a proposal, and I am anxious to advise you of the proposal because it requires a legislative appropriation of $679,000 if we're to begin to achieve the objectives which we think we should achieve. Now, the test is going to be whether or not the boards meant what they said when they passed those policies. As you know, our legislative request is submitted to the Board of Regents, and the Board of Regents submits it to the legislature. We had problems with that $679,000 when we appeared before the State Board for Vocational Education. Our budget request for next year, or our legislative request, is 31% above what we have this year. And that $679,000 certainly escalates that budget. And the State Board of Education didn't necessarily look favorably upon our request. We'll see now what happens to the regents. 
And in the final analysis, we'll see if they want us to work on individualized open entry, open exit instruction. And the test is whether or not they give us any money in that particular area. Now, I, I concur and concede that individualized instruction is is excellent method of instruction. I also feel equally keen about competency-based instruction. I don't believe that we should be tied to the age-old time frame that an individual, all individuals, have to be at this college for six quarters in order to graduate. I know there are individuals who could complete what we require of them perhaps in four quarters or five quarters, and they wouldn't need to be here in the time frame. But education is geared to a time frame. Individualized instruction would certainly change that. It could change it drastically, and we could then become geared to a competency-based level. Individualized instruction, of course, to me, is, is sort of like tutoring, and tutoring is great. It's done almost on a one-to-one -one basis, but it's also very expensive. And this $679,000 that we're asking for is not the end of our request if we proceed on individualized instruction. I think we're doing a great job. In instances where we can individualize our programs, I think we should individualize our programs. I also know that if this program succeeds and the legislature appropriates the money, that it'll be necessary for our instructional force perhaps to accept summer employment in order to write the curriculums for this individualized instruction. So there are lots of opportunities here. Of course, individualized instruction will require new curriculums, but it will require supplies, it will require a lot of equipment, and we're prepared to proceed along that route if people want us to. Now, finally, I'd just like to make a brief comment about overtraining. I'm concerned as president of Utah Technical College that Utah is going to find itself in the same situation here that uh, we found ourselves in here a couple of years ago with school teachers in the state of Utah. We just have too many. We are training too many. And I'm afraid personally, I'm concerned, not afraid, but I am concerned that if there isn't some control of the establishment of institutions, that we will train in vocational education too many people. Now, I personally can't conceive that every high school in the state of Utah, and there's 85 or 86 of them, I can't conceive of the fact that every high school ought to have an automotive program. There are all those high schools, there's area vocational centers, every two-year college in Utah now is getting into the act, the Vocational Education Act. It's big business. But if we're not careful, we're going to be training too many people. And that's one of the challenges you should give to your advisory committees. Ask their advice whether or not we are over flooding the market. Now, I know that in America we have the opportunity to study and learn and practice what we would like to do. As an American, that's our privilege. But certainly we have a responsibility, I think, that if there are not jobs available in the areas in which we're attempting to train them, then we ought to advise the student of that particular item. If we're not careful, the old pendulum in vocational education is going to swing too far. It'll bounce back, of course. But I hope we don't make that mistake that I referred to about the training of educators. And just a last comment concerning T&I in high schools. Now, I'm convinced personally that vocational education should be done on a post-high school level. I know that we can do some in high schools. In the business areas in high schools, they're doing a great job. But in the last follow-up report of T&I training in high school, which is three years ago, but in the last follow-up report, do you know that there were only 20% of the students who are trained in T&I programs who are placed on jobs? And that compares with training of 90% our job placement of at least 90% at this institution, and we can be very proud of that. Well, I strongly favor, of course, training on the, the post-high school level in vocational education. I've spoken candidly about these areas this morning because I think you ought to know how we feel. 
I sincerely hope that we can make progress in the areas I've mentioned. I'd like to conclude by saying that a short time ago, the papers here in Utah carried write-ups about the S&M Toy Manufacturing Company from Provo. This company was cited by cited as the Utah Small Business of 1975, and this company was also given the Small Business Administration Intermountain Regional Award. I was impressed with the comment the management made. The management was quoted as saying, you can start with a very limited budget, and believe me, we did. But it's the energy that goes into the business that pays off. And I testify to you that it's the energy that you people put forth in developing this great institution that will pay off on behalf of all of us. And I encourage each and every one of you to go the extra mile in this year ahead. I thank you very much. <clears throat> Now, just a couple of announcements. <clears throat> Next on the schedule is a refreshment break. Refreshments are free. They're in the foyer out here. We encourage you to uh, uh, participate and uh, then return. Uh, hopefully, we can return in 15 minutes. I say hopefully, and I do encourage you to do that because we have another session here. We've invited a very special guest this morning by the name of Fred S. Ball to talk to us, and I'm sure you'll appreciate Fred's message. Uh, so. After the break, I'd like you to be cognizant of this. The school has to go on. There may be a few, but a very few, who will, should be entitled to leave. And I hope the rest of you will return. At the conclusion of the second session, there will be a handout packet given to all, and all of you need and want that handout packet, I'm sure. So without further ado, the break. <clears throat>